good evening i welcome to this kgmu lecture series special lectures from professor matt oji from japan and and professor timothy lai from hong kong we are uh, indeed privileged to have them here king george's medical university is more than 100 years old the retina service has been running since 1972 so it's nearly 50 years now and uh, we have been doing uh, retinal detachment surgeries for long but pars plana vitrectomy surgery was started 25 years back and since then the department has been uh, evolving to serve the people of our state uh, well so we plan to have two guest lectures the first one will be delivered by dr masahito oji who is a professor and chairman in the department of of ophthalmology from shiga university in japan he has been involved in various capacities and has had a very illustrious career so he he is the vice president of the asia pacific vitreoretinal society yeah he has been involved with the veil vitrectomy meeting which is a very prestigious one he has been on the board of directors of the american society of retina specialists and has been in the executive committee member of the club jules gonin which is perhaps the most uh, elite group of the uh, retina people across the world and he has also served in the international council of ophthalmology he has had the uh, senior achievement award of the american academy of ophthalmology of the asia pacific ophthalmology and the very prestigious uh, uh, tano lecture award in 2018 and uh, indeed i think it's our privilege to have him here as he has also worked with the legendary dr professor yasuo tono and i feel that dr oji is uh, one of the four most vitro retinal surgeons and uh, thinkers from the asia pacific region and has earned a very creditable name across the world too he has been he has been honored by orvo also and and he has numerous publications and uh, book chapters to his uh, credit and serves on the editorial board of several reputed uh, uh, journals across the globe so it's indeed our privilege to have uh, matt oji with us today matt has been a very old friend of mine and uh, we have done some projects together also so i welcome you uh, dr oji to present your lecture on pars plana vitrectomy Okay. Thank you for kind invitation to the memorial meeting and the kind introduction. First, a congratulations on 25th anniversary of personal vitrectomy at the Department of Ophthalmology, King George Medical University. Uh, I'm Maroji from Japan. I have known very well Dr. Sandeep Saxena for a long time. We did have a, a good project, and I'm very happy. to give a talk today so i'd like to share my slide today i'm speaking on the role of parasitic vitrectomy in surgical disease of the ret retina here is my finance disclosure none of them are directly relevant to today my talk The modern cross vitrectomy was first developed and performed by Dr. Robert Macama in 1970 and was reported in the journal in 1971. His vitrectomy system is one port system including a 17 gauge vitrectomy probe combined with infusion just like a current fake machine. He used the slit lamp to eliminate the fundus. You can appreciate the large just a moment you can you can uh, appreciate the large instrument inside the eye he reported four cases treated with closed vitrectomy two pdr two cases with complicated retinal detachment and the vitrectomy was successful in all cases and the vision improved significantly in all cases postoperatively 
A couple uh, years after Dr. Makama's invention, Dr. Omari developed a 20-gauge three-port vitrectomy system, which had been mainstream for 30 years. In 2002, Dr. Jean Duan developed a 25-gauge cannula system, which was a major breakthrough in vitrectomy, followed by 23-gauge by Dr. Eckhart and 27-gauge by Dr. Oshima. This shows the market share of each gauge system in Japan. You can see here rapid movement toward the smaller gauge for the past several years. 25 gauge is most commonly used and 80% of cases were treated with 25 gauge. 27 gauge is also popular and was used in 18% of cases in 2020. In addition to the movement toward a smaller gauge, fundus viewing system is also improved. The fundus view through contact lens is limited, while wide angle viewing system can provide much wider area of the fundus. Any of wide angle viewing system offers wide, wide fundus view, which makes vitrectomy much more efficiently and much, more, much safer, especially in complicated cases. One of the recent advances include head-up vitrectomy with digitally assisted vitrectomy system. It provides better depth of focus, allowing high magnification, which is uh, useful for pre precise procedure, such as uh, membrane peeling. Currently, I use head-up surgery system in all cases, including fake surgery and vitrectomy. I believe this kind of digital system had more space to be improved and the image with use of a uh, digitally assisted vitrectomy system would be improved rapidly in future. Indication of vitrectomy include diabetic uh, retinopathy, retinal detachment, and macular disease such as epilateral membrane or uh, macular hole. And some macular hemorrhage can be also treated with vitrectomy. Today, I'd like to introduce some of the, these diseases. When we think about uh, diabetic retinopathy, vitrectomy can be used to treat uh, several conditions, including tractional retinal detachment and vitreous hemorrhage. Indication of diabetic macular edema for vitrectomy is still controversial. This shows a change in, in indication of vitrectomy for diabetic retinopathy in my hospital. In early 90s, tractional retinal detachment is most commonly indication, a most common indication for diabetic retinopathy, followed by vitreous hemorrhage. The number of patients with tractional retinal detachment has been de gradually decreased, probably due to the patient education, good diabetic control, and appropriate laser treatment. The number of vitrectomy for vitreous hemorrhage did not change over time, and the vitrectomy for diabetic macular edema became popular around the year of 2000, then decreased after the introduction of anti-VGF. Recently, Alcon released the advanced ultra-bit beveled high-speed probe. Beveled tip provides closer access to the tissue plane, and allow for segmentation and delamination, reducing the dependency on scissors and the forceps. Includes cut speed up to 10,000 per cut per minute can reduce the vitreous retinal traction and improve the duty cycle, provide more flow for faster vitreous removal. Let me see, a, let's, uh, let me show a case. This 31 year old gentleman had a very severe PDR and you cannot see the disc or macula, and it may be difficult to tell which eye is this, right or left. So we, we, we injected uh, one week before surgery, and then uh, vitrectomy was performed using Alcon Beverly 20 gauge cutter. Just a moment. I don't know why video, didn't work. Can you see the video? No, video is not working. I don't know why. Can you 
Oops. Okay. So <clears throat> you can appreciate the uh, peripheral membrane very tightly adhere to the retina. Such a thick membrane can be safely removed by a beveled cutter without using the uh, forceps or, or scissors. The retina was flattened after surgery, although some traction remained at the nasal area, which had no adverse e effect on vision, and the vision improved from hand motion to 0.07. As I said, bevacizumab was injected one week before vitrectomy. We measured the ACAS VGF level before injection and one week after injection or just before vitrectomy. As you know, VGF level increased in diabetic eyes. At one week after intravitreal injection of bevacizumab, VEGF in ACAS humor decreased to less than the lower limit of detection in all cases. Before injection, you can see that a strong leakage of fluorescent from a new vessel, while no leakage was found at one week after bevacizumab injection. We evaluated the surgical outcome of vitrectomy for traction retina detachment in Osaka University, where I used to work. We compared the result of vitrectomy for PDR between 20 gauge system without bevacizumab and MIBS with bevacizumab. As you can see here, operating time is shorter in MIBS with bevacizumab, and intraoperative bleeding was less in MIBS with bevacizumab. The use of bevacizumab makes vitrectin for PDR safer and more efficient. I would like to move to the diabetic macroedema or DME. Vitrectin for diabetic macroedema uh, was first reported by Dr. Hilel Ruiz in, in 1992. He performed the vitrectomy in patients with diabetic macroedema with thick and tight posterior membrane and reported that the vitrectomy with the creation of posterior detachment was effective in improving in vision and edema. Then vitrectomy has been reported to be effective in eye without with, without such thick and tight hyaluronic membrane, or even in eye with posterior vitreal detachment or PVD. There, there are many publications supporting vitrectin for DME, while some publications did not support it. This is a result of a survey. We asked uh, to Japanese retina specialist which treatment uh, <coughs> option would you use to treat diabetic macroedema? 70% of retina specialists chose anti-BGF followed by a sub injection of triabcinone acetonide. When we asked the treatment option that you would, you would use to treat diabetic macroedema with traction, almost 90% of retina specialists chose vitrectomy. This is another question. If diabetic macroedema did not respond well to anti-BGF or laser, what treatment would you do? More than 70% of retina specialists chose vitrectomy. This is a 71-year-old lady. Had, uh, uh, this 71-year-old uh, lady had been treated with intravitreal injection of ranibizumab four times. However, macroedema did not improve or slightly got worse. Then we performed vitrectomy. After vitrectomy, macroedema uh, has gone and the vision improved from 0.2 to 0.5. We evaluated the efficacy of vitrectin for diabetic macroedema in 99 eyes. 17 eyes were excluded from this study because, uh, because of significant cat cataract or retinal disease other than DME, such as epithelial membrane and vitreal macular attraction. Then, 81 eyes without significant cataract nor retinal disease other than DME were evaluated. The slide on the left showed the change of retinal thickness over time. As you can see here, retinal thickness gradually but significantly decreased from 5, 500, 533 micrometer before surgery 
to 346 micrometer, six, uh, po, uh, six months postoperatively. Visual acuity also improves significantly from 0.79 logma unit preoperatively to 0.61 logma unit postoperatively. This improvement mean is equal to nine ETDS letters. This shows the relationship between macular thickness and visual acuity. Macular edema improved and the vision also improved in 70% of cases, while macular edema improved, but vision got worse in 16% of cases. So vitrectomy is effective for anatomical improvement in 86% of cases. We also evaluate the efficacy of vitrectomy among types of DME, sponge-like diffuse retinal thickness, sister macular edema, serious retinal detachment, combination of all pathology. What we found is that vitrectomy is more effective in eyes with serious retinal detachment and the eyes with all pathology. This means vitrectomy is more effective for diabetic macular edema with subretinal fluid. Why vitrectomy is effective for DME? To clarify the mechanism, we measured ACAS VGF concentration in animal model using a uh, monkey. ACAS humor was collected just before vitrectomy and three months after vitrectomy in monkey. We waited for three months to see settle down the inflammation caused by surgery. Mean BGF concentration in ACAS humor was 81 picogram per ml before vitrectomy and significant decrease to 51 picogram postoperatively. The reduction of VGF may explain why vitrectomy is effective for diabetic macular edema. This is a summary of vitrectomy for PDR DME. Recent innovation in instrument are the adjunctive improved outcome of vitrectomy for PDR. Anti-VGF is the first choice for DME. However, vitrectomy would be an option for diabetic macular edema, especially DME with traction or DME with subretinal fluid or eye with poor response to anti-VGF. Vitrectomy decreased VGF concentration in the eye. But let's move on to the retinal detachment. This shows a procedure uh, or a procedure change for retinal detachment in United States from 1997 to 2007. As you can see here, the number of square buckle surgery shown in red significant decrease from uh, decreased by 69 percent during the 10 years, while the number of vitrectomies increased by 72 percent. In 2007, almost 90% of retinal detachment were treated with vitrectomy. This is a, this is a trend for ret of retinal detachment surgery in Vienna, Australia, uh, Australia from 2009 to 2015. Again, square buckle surgery has been decreasing and the vitrectomy has been increasing. In recent several years, more than 90% of retinal detachment were treated with vitrectomy. How about the retinal detachment surgery in my hospital or Japan? This was the procedure for retinal detachment in my hospital from 2005 to 2017. The number of square buckle surgery shown in red was about 20% in 2005, but only 6% in 2017. More than 90% of retinal detachment cases had been treated with vitrectomy during the past 10 years. This slide shows a relationship between age and surgical procedure for retinal detachment in my hospital. Almost all patients older than 30 years old underwent vitrectomy, and patients younger than 30 years old underwent square buckling surgery. Reattachment of retina is the most important for retinal detachment surgery. There are several uh, reports comparing single operation success rate in retinal reattachment between vitrectomy and square buckle. As you can see here, both square buckle and the vitrectomy are good uh, treatment option for primary pri uh, phakic retinal detachment. And the vitrectomy seems to achieve a slightly better success rate 
for pseudo-phagic retinal detachment. So in summary of retinal detachment, vitrectomy is performed in 90% of cases with retinal detachment, while scleral buckling surgery is preferred for retinal detachment in young patients. Vitrectomy achieves similar or slightly better anatomical success rate compared with scleral buckling procedure. The last topic today is submacular hemorrhage. As you know well, submacular hemorrhage can be treated, can be caused by various kinds of disease, including age-related macular degeneration, polypoidal colloid vasculopathy, or macular aneurysm. A natural cause of submacular hemorrhage is generally poor. Bennett reported that the visual acuity of 2200 or better was achieved only in one eye out of 12 eyes and two over 200 or worse in 50% of cases. Avery reported that the visual acuity got worse by six lines or more in 41% of cases. Subretinal uh, sub hemorrhage caused by macroanism may achieve better visual outcome. However, visual acuity decreased 20, 100 or worse in most cases. In 1996, Dr. Helios developed a wonderful technique to treat submacular hemorrhage. He injected the TPA and gas into the vitreous cavity and asked the uh, patient to keep prone position. TPA may liquefy subretinal cloth and the liquefied blood was pushed down toward the inferior by gas. This is a, a case treated with TPA and gas. TPA and uh, C3F8 was injected 14 days after onset, and submacular hemorrhage was nicely displaced inferiorly. Visual acuity improved from 0.1 to 0.8. We reported in 1998 that injection of gas only may achieve similar effect in the displacement of subretinal hemorrhage. We injected c 3 f gas into vitreous cavity and did not inject TPA. Then we asked the patients to keep prone positioning. This is a case who, uh, who was treated with a C3F gas injection alone. 69-year-old gentleman visited a hospital five days after sudden visual loss. C3F gas alone was uh, injected into the vitreous cavity. Major part of subretinal hemorrhage was displaced from the macula, and the visual acuity improved from 0.08 to 0.8 in two days. We compare the displacement of some macular hemorrhage between patient treated with gas alone and the patient treated with gas and TPA. Uh, there were no statistically significant difference between two groups. However, patient was with good score of displacement to be more in combination group. So TPA, T-plasminoid mineralogen activator may not be essential, but may facilitate displacement. When we see the visual acuity change, visual acuity improved in most cases, both in gas alone group and gas and TPA group. And there was no statistically significant difference in visual acuity change between the two groups. So this comes from a PATH survey by American Society of, uh, American Society of Retina Specialists and the PATH J survey by Japanese uh, Retina and Vitreous Retina Society. Almost no one chose the observation. Anti-VEGF therapy without displacement of subretinal hemorrhage is most commonly used in the United States, and the pneumatic displacement with or without TPA is most commonly used in Japan. Vitrectomy with subretinal injection of TPA is also another option. How about very ma massive subretinal hemorrhage shown here? The natural cause of massive submarkal hemorrhage is terribly bad, and the visual acuity decreases hand motion or light perception in many cases. This is a fundus photo of a 74 year old gentleman who suffered from sudden visual loss and was, was referred to our hospital. You can appreciate the massive subretinal hemorrhage involving the macula, and the vision was hand motion. I developed a technique to treat the mass subject hemorrhage. TPA was injected into the vitreous cavity and performed vitrectomy on the next day. 
Following core vitrectomy, we injected powerful liquid into the vitreous cavity to displace subretina sub hemorrhage toward the periphery. Then peripheral retinotomy was created at the area close to the aura serrata, and subretinal hemorrhage migrated into the vitreous cavity through peripheral retinotomy, and that was aspirated. You can see the massive subretinal hemorrhage and bullous retinal detachment involving the macula. After core vitrectomy, parfluorocarbon was injected into the vitreous cavity, and the parfluorocarbon liquid displaces subretinal hemorrhage toward anteriorly or periphery. And the retinotomy was created at the, uh, the area close to the aura serrata. Then I injected parfluorocarbon liquid more to displace sub, uh, subretinal hemorrhage, uh, displace hemorrhage from subretinal space to the vitreous cavity. Then hemorrhage on the parfluorocarbon liquid was aspirated safely and cryotexy was applied to the retinotomy followed by fluid air exchange. And the visual, uh, visual acuity improved from hand motion preoperatively to 0.06 at one month after surgery. Ranibizumab was injected into the vitreous space several times, and the visual acuity improved to 0.3 at 32 months after surgery, and the visual field also recovered. We previously reported visual acuity change after this technique in eight patients with massive subretinal sub hemorrhage. Visual acuity improved in seven cases, and the visual acuity of 2200 or better was achieved in four out of eight cases. Recently, external drainage of subretinal hemorrhage during vitrectomy was also performed on the next day of intravitreal injection of TPA. This is a 74-year-old gentleman with a massive subarachnoid hemorrhage. Visual acuity was 0.01, and the visual field was uh, uh, limited. After coavitrectomy, parfluorocarbon liquid was injected into the vitreous cavity to displace subretinal hemorrhage toward the periphery or anteriorly. Sclerotomy was created, and the uh, choroid was perforated by a small needle. The, and then dense subretinal hemorrhage comes out and was drained externally. When we push the square, you can see that a very dense uh, subretinal hemorrhage comes out. Following vitrectomy, the external drainage of massive subretinal hemorrhage vision improved to 0.4, and the visual field also improved. This is a summary of a subretinal hemorrhage. Pneumatic displacement with or without uh, TPA is useful in most cases. Uh, vitrectomy with subretinal TPA injection and the free the air exchange is another option. A massive subretinal hemorrhage can be treated with vitrectomy. In conclusion, indication of vitrectomy has been expanded, achieving better outcome. I believe vitrectomy will become more efficient and more safely in future. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Matt. Yes. And it's it has been indeed a pleasure listening to you about the about the various indications of uh, parse planar vitrectomy, and surely with time the the techniques as well as the the, the instrumentation has improved uh, very much to help us all, both from the uh, medical personnel aspect as well as from the patient aspect, and we have been able to to achieve very good results. Uh, thank you, Matt, for sparing your time. It's it's quite way into the night in in Japan. I and I thank you very much for your lecture. Thank you. So now, thank you so much. So thank you so much for, for kind of invitation. Thank you. So now we will move on. Uh, Professor Abjit Kaur, our head of the head of the head of the department, has also joined in this program, and.
over the past 25 years or so we have been able to do nearly 25000 scleral buckling and pars plana vitrectomy procedures helping the area of our uh, uh, concern and the people of our state so next we have dr timothy lai so uh, professor timothy lai is from the department of ophthalmology and uh, visual sciences in hong kong and is also the di the director of retina and macula center in hong kong he has had a very illustrious career and he has been awarded with uh, nakajima award of the asia pacific academy of ophthalmology the senior achievement award of the american academy the constable lecture award of the of the asia pacific society and the and the senior achievement award of apao so basically i'd like to stress that in uh, today's lecture both matt and uh, uh, timothy have had a very uh, a significant role in uh, developing the asia pacific aspects of the vitro retinal society and they have had the high, the highest awards to their credit dr lai has a number of publications to his uh, credit more than 250 publications and serves on the editorial board of more than uh, 10 international journals like retina eye clinical and experimental ophthalmology of ophthalmologica and the asia pacific journal he is the vice president of the asia pacific vitreo retinal society and also the chair of the aao global well advisory board and 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 has also edited a retina atlas series which we have done together and that comprises of nine volumes so it's indeed a pleasure to have uh, timothy in hong kong also it's it's quite it's quite in the night on the weekend and i thank you very much for sparing your your valuable time for being here and and we look forward to your lecture timothy please go on Thank you very much, uh, Sandeep, for the very kind invitation and uh, congratulations on uh, doing 25 years of very good work uh, with Trectomy in uh, in uh, your center, and uh, it's a big achievement. So, uh, in this uh, 20-30 minutes or so, I'm going to share with you um, something about uh, advances in retinal imaging. Um, Uh, basically talking about multimodal imaging, uh, taking myopia and PCVX examples. So these are my uh, financial disclosures. And um, so in terms of multimodal imaging, you know that we now have many other uh, imaging modalities, including uh, fundus uh, photography, um, like color fundus photo, infrared, red-free, uh, also fundus autofluorescence, Um, and uh, for the dye and geography, we have uh, fluorescein and geography as well as uh, indocyanine green and geography, and also OCT. We now have OCT and OCT A, OCT and geography. So let's look at these very briefly. So uh, as you know, most of the time we do uh, the OCT now, and we use the high resolution spectral domain OCT. And this is an example uh, of the uh, ERM showing. Uh, you can see multiple layers, and um, you can see also using these images to predict, for example, the surgical outcome afterwards. This is uh, infrared imaging. Uh, this is red-free imaging. Uh, something uh, that is uh, also gaining a lot of interest is uh, fundus autofluorescence. For example, in this patient, you can see it's a patient with uh, cone dystrophy, and you can see this kind of ring uh, of uh, increased autofluorescence, signifying that uh, these RPs are under stress. And at the center, you get a gradual loss of the autofluorescence because of the, the death of the RP cells. Here, uh, of course, the very familiar forest angiography, which has been around with us for over the 30 years now. And you can see the leakages of, uh, in this patient with uh, diabetic macular edema. Here, it's the ICG angiography, which of course, it's um, the standard, uh, that the gold standard that we use to diagnose our, uh, the P PCV patient, polyporto-choroidal vasculopathy uh, patient, and I'll talk more about it later on. 
So let's uh, talk about two specific diseases, which is actually uh, quite important uh, in my clinic uh, because uh, we have high prevalence of these conditions. Firstly, is uh, myopic uh, CMV uh, or pathologic myopia. So myopic CMV occurs in about 5 to 10% of high myops. Um, if you don't treat these patients, they might have actually very poor vision afterwards. And therefore, it's important for us to diagnose them very uh, promptly because now effective anti regia therapy is available to treat them. So in a very recent uh, International Mackler Institute uh, white paper that I published uh, with um, uh, Professor Kyoko Ono Matsui and others uh, uh, who are experts in um, myopia, we um, uh, look at the issue of uh, high myopia and when is the pathologic myopia defined. And here you can see that uh, in normal fundus, you get uh, this tessellated fundus. And then with gradual choroidal thinning, you then get the various form of the atrophy, including the peripapillar atrophy, uh, the um, diffuse atrophy, macular atrophy, and patchy atrophy. And some patients will develop the myopic uh, CNV or myopic MNV, they now call the macular neovascularization. And uh, you also get some uh, atrophy related to that. So why do we need to do the multimodal imaging to diagnose um, these patients with pathologic myopia? Because um, you need to differentiate myopic CMV from other conditions. For example, patients with coexisting uh, degenerative changes associated with myopia, like uh, myopic traction maculopathy or myopic fulvial schesis, um, macular hole, a retro detachment, dome-shaped macular, staphyloma, and other atrophic changes. And also you want to differentiate it from uh, other forms of CNV, for example, like uh, patients with uh, neovascular AMD, uh, CNV due to um, uh, PIC, uh, PIC, uh, PIC, which is punctate inner choroidopathy, multifocal choroiditis, or sometimes it's just a simple macular hemorrhage, uh, which is associated with lacrimal cracks without a CNV formation. And these patients, we don't need to do any injection. The hemorrhage will just go away. So it's just some example, you see a patient here with a dot of hemorrhage and you want to know what's happening. So sometimes actually there's a schesis, um, malpink macular schesis or actually malpink macular hole uh, detachment. So let's focus on some of these uh, imaging modality. FA, uh, of course, is still very commonly used because it actually shows you the leakage. And sometimes the leakage might be very subtle and could be the only sign of myopic CNV activity. And we can use it to determine the CNV location in these patients. So this is a patient, you can see from this photo uh, showing this lesion and it's leaking on the uh, FFA. And uh, so it's a, basically a myopic CNV in this very tessellated uh, fundus, a patient of minus eight doctor of myopia. And of course, we're now using more and more SDOCT, spectral domain OCT, and it can allow us to have the qualitative and quantitative assessment of the macular fluid in these patients. And uh, most of the patient will have this highly re refractive dome shape elevation above the RP because these are mostly type 2 CNV. And we're going to also use the enhanced depth imaging to document the choroidal thickness. So a patient, you can see the lesion at the macula uh, uh, with the thin choroid because of the choroidal thinning. Here, a patient, you can also see FA showing the leakage from the CNV with um, the block fluorescence due to the hemorrhage. But if you do the SEOCT as well, you can see it's not a simple lesion. This is the CME lesion, but this patient also has some myopic traction maculopathy, so a double pathology in this case. And the patient had an anti-VGF injection. You can see improvement, uh, regression of the CNV very well, but still the traction maculopathy still persisted. Um, so how does uh, FA compare with SDOCT and myopic CME? So uh, in the majority of case, uh, it's actually showing the extradative feature better on FFA, about 20, uh, about 82% uh, can show you the extradative features, but uh, for the OCT, only about 48%. So you can diagnose CNV uh, based on FA alone in 61%. Uh, OCT along about 22% and in both um, uh, from 8 to 16%. And actually there was no agreement in signs be, uh, of active CME between FA and OCT imaging. How about ICJ? So it's uh, useful as an adjunct and allows you to better document the liquor crack formation and CR atrophy. 
Uh, but because DCMB usually have a very low activity and therefore they do not show up very well on ICG and geography. And um, you can also use ICG to exclude PCV, but uh, in most of the P these patients, for example, a very large series in Korea, they looked at over uh, 290 uh, eyes with myopic CMV and none of them actually had polypoidal lesion. How about fundus autofluorescence? So it's actually useful to look at the um, extent of uh, atrophy, and also sometimes it can have a mixed form of hyper uh, and uh, hypo autofluorescence lesion in these cases. So this is example, you can see this patient with myopic CM with some hemorrhage around, and this is the uh, uh, the uh, FH, you can see the leakage from the CNV and on the autofluorescence, you can see the area of the uh, curatin atrophy and this is showing up a rim of hyperfluorescence and this actually gives you some prognostic indication that the CNV after regression, the patient's uh, RP is still active so they might uh, have better visual prognosis. So in this case, uh, patients uh, had uh, this series um, Renibuzumab injection, and they looked at the fungus autofluorescence uh, pattern. So uh, patients with uh, initial hyperfluorescence actually improved by uh, about 1.6 in the log mass scale, but those with uh, patchy autofluorescence group actually reduced by about uh, 0 0.5. So it has some prognostic um, um, uh, uh, pro uh, significance. Of course, nowadays uh, we have more technology when it's OCT and, and geography, and you can uh, look at these patterns of OCT uh, and geography showing the uh, leads, the CNV very well uh, within the um, macula. And you can use it to document some regression of the uh, CNV lesion, for example, here uh, before the injection, the seven days after the injection showing uh, good anatomical regression, and OCT also, OCTA also confirming the regression of the lesion. And uh, now it's used more clinically because it's non-invasive. So, and this is a very good paper uh, by uh, Professor uh, Sir Prasad in, uh, uh, in UK. Uh, her group looked at uh, 27 eyes with myopic CNV and had FA, SDOCT, as well as OCT and geography. And based on these assessments, they found FA sensitivity of about 85%, uh, spectral domain OCT also about 85%, OCTA about 74%, but combining the two, you can actually increase uh, to about 60, uh, 97, 98%. And uh, so this is the algorithm. So they now do the SDOCT and then they'll do the OCT and geography. Uh, if uh, it's available, then it's positive. Then you treat it as a myopic CMV without doing the uh, fundus uh, forcing and geography. But uh, if it's negative or not available, then you still have to do at the FA to treat the patient. And uh, of course, you now also have uh, AI uh, with deep learning, so artificial intelligence with deep learning. And you can look at uh, these uh, various uh, photos and then the AI can grade it um, to see whether it's actually uh, predicting the, the kind of uh, atrophy, the stage that they are on. And uh, it's showing that um, the accuracy, however, is not ideal. So um, the patient's AUC for myopic CM is only about uh, 0.88. So um, they still have to do some work, but uh, for in terms of diffuse atrophy, patchy atrophy, they're actually doing very, very well. So now I'll go to PCV, polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy, which is actually quite prevalent in our population. Um, these Asians, around about 30 to 40% of Asians presenting uh, as a neovascular AMD picture. And you can see these uh, polypoidal lesions showing up very well on the ICJ as these uh, aneurysmal lesion, we call them polypoidal lesions. So ICJ is still the gold standard of choice because the ICG molecule is highly bound in the protein and it remains in the choroidal vessels. And with the infrared imaging, um, we can actually sh show through the um, RP hemorrhage and heart exudate a bit better. So we can show up the choroidal circulation very well. So clinical features, as I mentioned before, grape-like polyps, uh, so you can also see it in the uh, clinical uh, examination as orange uh, nodules. And the other important component is the branching vascular network as shown in ICG here. So the most commonly used diagnostic criteria for PCV is based on the EFRS study, which is the first multi-centered uh, RCT for uh, PCV. 
And um, so the PCB is diagnosed uh, based on the central reading center grading of a uh, confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscope space ICGA. You need to have this presence of subretinal focal ICG hyperfluorescence together with any one of these following. So branching vascular network, pulsatile polyp because they take the video and geography, nodule appearance when they, it's viewed stereoscopically, presence of hypofluorescent halo orange subretinal nodule on color photograph and massive hemorrhage. So another example, you can see the uh, polypoidal lesions as well as the branching vascular network here. So uh, this is another patient, uh, PED with the polyps on the edge. Again, uh, great like clusters of polyps. Uh, of course, we have two systems. So one is the confocal la scanning laser, laser ophthalmoscope and the other is a flash-based uh, ICG and geography. So which one is, this, is better? So we actually did a, a group, uh, group together to compare the images uh, to see which is better. So we looked at uh, 65 eyes in 44 patients uh, all, both patients had both imaging done, and uh, about 55% were PCV patient, 44% were AMD patient, and we correlated at that, at them. Uh, there was more direct correlation between these two systems, and both systems were able to detect over 80% of PCV cases based on the nodular appearance of the pulp. So nodular appearance is uh, the most important uh, um, uh, feature. But uh, if you look at other features, the S confocal scanning laser of Thonsco actually did quite well, particularly uh, the branching vascular network, which showed up in 75% of CSLO images, but uh, only about 33% of fundus image. And here are same examples. You can see the left side is a flash-based ICG, right side is the uh, HRA confocal scanning laser or thermoscope based ICG. And uh, you can see both sides actually detected the polyps as well as the branching vaccine network quite well here. Again, in another case, both case, uh, cases also demonstrating the um, polypoidal lesion as well as the branching vascular network. But uh, in this case, the flash ICG basically pick up the polyp, but not the branching vascular network, which is shown very well in the um, HRA scan. How about fundus uh, autofluorescence? So uh, FA, it's uh, not too useful. It can show some leakage, but you are unable to distinguish whether it's an occult CNV or actually a PCV lesion. Uh, of course, fundus appearance is actually quite important because we can actually see the orange nodule in some cases. And you also, uh, the characteristics of these PCV cases is the lack of soft juice and, and also sometimes associated with uh, massive bleeding. Here, another case uh, with the um, hemorrhage, uh, the orange nodule and heart actually around that lesion, the fellow eye already has a scar due to a previous episode of massive bleeding. So Dr. Uh, Chikshin Mokong in, um, in Chiang Mai in Thailand, she published a very good paper in gel morphology and looking at all the non-ICJ uh, features of PCV. So some of them are the fundus features. Um, here is showing the subretinal orange nodule and then you also have the massive retinal hemorrhage as well as the uh, hemorrhage or notch PED. Um, and with the SDOCT, you can also see these uh, polypoidal lesions uh, as the notched uh, multi lobulated PED as well as a double layer sign with the fluid. So these are the key spectral domain features of uh, PCV, sharp peak thumb like notch M-shaped hyperreflective brain PED, um, the double layer sign, Pachycoroid. So in the young patients, you see a thick choroid and also on fast OCT, you can see the RPE rings. For the sharp PPD, how do we define it? So basically it's a drawing the line from the RPE to the edge of the polyp. And then if this angle is 70 to 90 degrees uh, or more, then it's a PCV kind of lesion. If it's below uh, 70 degrees, then it's probably like a neovascular AMD lesion as shown here. This is an M-shaped double hump PED um, here showing the hyperreflective ring. And if uh, in this paper, they look at all the AUC combining some of these features. And uh, when two of these features were present, AUC about 0.93. As I mentioned before, enhanced def depth imaging can show you the choroidal layer and in PCV and CSC, because these are basically uh, what we call pachycoroid eye disease disorder. So you can see the PCV and CSC patients, they tend to have thicker choroid compared with our controls. And you can also see on the on fast OCT, uh, see these uh, um, pachy vessels because of the thick choroid um, 
uh, vessels running through it. So a group of us are actually uh, uh, grouped together, the uh, APOIS, the Asia Pacific Ocular Imaging Society, which is uh, formed uh, about two years ago. And actually there's a PC work group, which we want to uh, promote the use of ocular imaging to understand PCV and management worldwide. And um, our group is uh, chaired by uh, Professor Jamie Chung in Singapore, Wen Ki Lee in uh, Korea and myself. And uh, these are the men members in uh, various countries uh, throughout the world. And um, we actually had some consensus meeting, evaluated uh, some exercise. So our first study was to look at non-ICGA-based diagnosis of PCV, and this was published in uh, ophthalmology last year. And uh, we recommended using, uh, based on multiple modal imaging, the term for the polypoidal polyps on ICJ, we call them polypoidal lesions. And um, the branching vascular network, we now call them branching neovascular network. And for the nine non ICJ features, which might be useful for predicting PCV, we included the sharp peak PED, sub RP ring like lesion, complex lobulated PED, double layer sign, thick choroid with dilated high level vessel fluid compartment, so mostly a subretinal fluid, minimal intraretinal fluid, or in fast OCT showing this complex RP elevation, and on the fundus uh, appearance, you get a massive subretinal hemorrhage, and of course the orange nodule. So looking at these features, so we graded all these uh, images, so uh, uh, some images from Singapore set and some from the Milan set, and we found that the most predictive ones were sub RP, ring-like lesion, on fast OCT, RP, complex elevation, and sub, uh, the, these uh, sharp peak PEDs. And uh, by having uh, two, all three criteria, we get an AUC of about 0 0.9, and sensitivity of 75%, and specificity of 91%. So in the subsequent paper, and then we looked at whether we can actually use this criteria to look at some of the non-responsive patients to NTV just patients. So these patients, uh, uh, we want to see whether we can differentiate PCV from the typical neovascular MD patients. So these patients would have had uh, three loading doses NTV just monotherapy. And then we want, also want to where, see whether we can use the OCT alone to guide our PDT treatment. So in this paper published um, in ophthalmology retina earlier this year, you can see that um, the most predictive um, ones were sharp peak PAD, sub RP ring like lesion and orange nodule. And by combining them, we get a, a UC of about 0.85, so pretty reasonable. So, and also we graded the, um, the individual images to see how they correlate. So we put a grid onto this uh, OCT um, image as well as onto the infrared image. And we can actually uh, look at the lesion and then we draw the uh, size of that uh, lesion uh, onto the grid so that we can determine the location of the PDT plan size like this. And then we send the image back to the um, uh, coordinating center, uh, back to uh, Ke um, the Kevin uh, in Singapore. And here is a second case. So you graded these individually. You can see the double layer sign, the polypoidal lesions. And this is the area that we, we want to apply the PET. And there's a third case. So you can see uh, sort of a, a more eccentric case in this case, like here. And then we actually correlated them. Actually, the results were quite remarkable. So uh, the uh, GLD greatest leaning dimension on the OCT guided PDT was about uh, 3,260 micron. For uh, ICG, which is the gold standard, is about 3,600 uh, 3, micron. So quite well correlated. And we could actually manage to cover 100% of the polypoidal lesion and about 91% of the branching neovascular network. So you can still reliably use the um, PD, um, OCT to do your combination therapy if needed. So of course, I uh, have to talk about OCTA nowadays. So this uh, technology um, basic measure but the blood flows inside the, uh, um, the uh, retina and choroid, but it does not show the leakage. And in PCV uh, cases, it's been shown to be able to detect the BVN, the branching renal vascular network very well in 100% of the eyes, but the polypoidal lesions are seen only about 50%. And uh, some of the reason might be because of the turbulent flow inside the polyp. Uh, so the um, blood might be just circling in the walls of the polyp, so it might not show up very well. 
and um, and other paper from uh, Professor Ogura's group in Japan. Um, they also show that um, you can detect the polyp, but then uh, the activity is not clear based on the OCTA alone. And um, so uh, Jamie's group also did another paper to try to enhance the detection diagnosis. And they actually had to use both the structural OCT and OCT and they get a very uh, reasonable sensitivity and specificity to enhance it. So you can't just look at the on fast OCTA, you have to look at the cross-sectional OCTA as well as the structural OCT to see whether the polyps are active or not. So just to summarize, so advances in multimodal imaging technology has greatly improved our visualization of the retinal choroid, ICG and um, FA. They are still gold standard in the diagnosis of some retinal diseases, but the, with the rapid improvement in imaging technology, such as uh, spectral domain OCT and OCTA, they have enabled a uh, much better diagnosis of retinal diseases non-invasively. So lastly, I have to thank uh, again uh, for your, the Sandeep's invitation. So we have collaborated many projects together. These are some of our papers um, together. And also, uh, of course, our uh, Retina Atlas, which is um, being, the large one is uh, actually coming out soon uh, later this year. So thank you very much. Thank you, Timothy, very much for, for the kind words as well as for a very nice lecture. And it's indeed been a pleasure having both Matt and Tim here for these celebrations. And uh, today we have uh, Dr. Abjit Kaur, our head of the department, the chairperson of our uh, department also with us. And I'd like her to say uh, uh, a, a few words before we do our good night. Ma'am, please. Good evening and a special warm welcome to Dr. Oji and Dr. Lai. I basically am an oculoplastic surgeon. So I have been left totally mesmerized. Both the talks were so illustrative and it was like an academic treat. Really, really beautiful and great work that both of you have put in and taken the science of retinal uh, diseases to such high platforms. Thank you once again 